Welcome back to Your Story Medicine. Today, I am with Dr. Kiki Steiner, gender pronouns, she, her, sha. And Kiki is a holistic vocal coach, choral conductor, and decolonization coach. And Sha is currently serving as an adjunct instructor of music at Milliken University in the choral conducting and music education area. As founder of Decolonizing Kiki, LLC, what, what? Her work as a holistic vocal coach focuses on empowering others to connect with their voice through releasing shame around one's voice and facilitating self-led healing. And it is such a beautiful reunion to be with Dr. Kiki because I had the absolute privilege of sharing space with Shaw during Roots to Rise. And it has been even medicine for me to see your growth, your healing, one that is rooted in joy and liberation and the rewards of actually saying yes to this journey of decolonization. So what a privilege to have you here today, Kiki. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be to be part of this and to share my story with your community. So just like how we did during our sessions, I want to mm -hmm. hear what is it that you are celebrating about yourself today? Oh, today I am I'm celebrating so many things right now. Um, one of the, the major blessings in my life is I'm a transracial adoptee. And recently my biological father just moved here from the island of Oahu in the kingdom of Hawaii to Kickapoo lands here in central Illinois, where I'm currently residing. And um, we are now spending each day together, um, reunited and reconnecting with one another and and celebrating our Filipino ancestors every day that we can. Oh, so for folks who are new to the term transracial adoptee, mm -hmm. how would you break that down? Yeah, so I was born and raised in Ho-Chunk lands in southwestern Wisconsin in a predominantly white community and adopted by a single mom um, with ancestry in from England and Germany. And so I grew up as a uh, biracial Filipino child in an all-white uh, family. And so uh, my experience growing up was um, seeing and being raised by family members and community members that did not look like me. Okay, I feel like we're gonna have to have several conversations to <laughs> really uh, just get a gl even just a glimpse of your story medicine. So before we go into that, uh, tell us more about how you would describe the medicine it is you have to bring to the world. Yeah, so my medicine is really about activating creativity through connecting with what I call these days, one soul's unique frequency, their voice, and connecting through the voice to be able to activate creativity, to, to imagine, envision, and, and dream about what liberation looks like for ourselves, our communities, and the next generation. Amazing. I feel like when it comes to singing or the arts in general, because as, as an artist myself, I grew up feeling like in order to be an artist, that it required external validation. It mm -hmm. required that my teachers told me whether or not I can draw, whether or not I can sing, I had to hit the perfect note. I had to know my difference between my complementary and my primary colors. And I felt like even when I uh, went to school initially as an arts education major, mm -hmm. I remember, <laughs> I remember pulling an all-nighter for one of my art pieces only to get a B on it. And then another project, I'm like, eh, fuck it. Let me just put something together real quick, like 30 minutes before mm -hmm. class and then getting an A on it. And then just being so confused about, okay, what does it mean 
then to be mm-hmm. an artist. And, mm-hmm. and, and so, so for you choosing the path of music, especially choral conducting, <laughs> I'm so curious about where decolonization comes in. So, so before we go mm-hmm. into that, share with us more about your ancestral lineage and how this is influencing your medicine today. Yeah, absolutely. So learning about my ancestral lineage has been really powerful as an adoptee because so much of my personal history was unknown for a very long time until I started to reunite with my biological families. So I I first connected with my biological mother when I was about 20 years old. And uh, from that family, I um, gain ancestry from uh, Switzerland, uh, Ireland, Scotland, and England. And I learned through that reunion that um, I actually wasn't the first uh, musician that went to college for learning about music education, Um, that actually that is another um, ancestral gift and blessing that I've been gifted, Um, that I have a great aunt that was a voice teacher at the collegiate level for many years. Um, I have uncles with master's degrees in music performance. And so there were all of these connections that I was making, um, but also recognizing that that was my English, Switzerland, Swiss, um, German sides of me, and um, always desiring to really understand why when I look in the mirror, I don't see that part of me. And so um, it took until my reunification with my dad in 2020, to learn about my Filipino culture and family and history um, for me to begin really understanding what decolonization means for me and how that applies to my my story. Um, And so decolonization, um, as an adoptee, I feel like I've been colonized on so many levels. Um, And what colonization really means to me is a separation and a dissociation from oneself and one's truth. Um, So being dissociated and separated from one's motherland, one's mother tongue, um, spirituality, uh, the land, um, nature, and just the divinity of the cosmos and and where we find ourselves um, in this moment. And so through recognizing and reading and learning about Spanish colonization in the Philippines um, and realizing that my ancestors who then migrated to the island of Oahu and the kingdom of Hawaii um, were separated first from their motherland due to a desire to take care of their family, to um, provide for their children, to provide for the next generation. And through colonization and all of these ways that uh, capitalism and patriarchy go hand in hand with white supremacy, uh, my, my ancestors had to make really really big decisions that that continue to separate us from our truths, from our from our homes, and um, from places where our people were were celebrated and seen as full in their whole selves in their fullness. Um, And so through my connection with my dad, and learning about the family history and these stories, I just saw pattern after pattern and cycle after cycle of of being separated and being further displaced from from these lands and from this pre-colonized belief and understanding of who we are um, because it's just been part of our family history for so long. Um, And so that decolonization in connection with uh, choral conducting and music um, I was just able to see, you know, Filipinos are known for, for singing karaoke and, and celebrating and singing and, and eating lots of food. Um, and so that I, I realized, oh, I've always been Filipino at heart <laughs> that mm. um, in my, in my, you know, like when I was in my bedroom growing up, when I was just singing and dancing and having my own karaoke parties, uh, that I was being Filipino and I didn't even know it um, because I didn't know I was Filipino until I was about 27 years old um, when the ancestry DNA algorithm caught up to being able to even say, yes, you are 50% Filipino. 
Um, and so it took a very long time for me to be able to connect to these different parts of myself um, and to be able to celebrate it in the ways that I'm able to now. Okay. And I'm probably as curious as our listeners as mm -hmm. to how it is you even found your biological family to begin with. Yeah, yeah. Um, truly, it was um, through Ancestry DNA. Um, I took the test initially just, as I said, to find out my ethnicity. Um, looking in the mirror and not having those answers was something that I really, really struggled with, especially in um, especially going through, you know, 2017 to 2020, when we had a lot of racial uprisings, and it really became clear here on Turtle Island, aka the United States, that, um, you know, we have clear issues with, uh, with white supremacy, and the ways that black and brown folks are treated in this country. And so I was really trying to figure out what my place was as an ally, as an advocate, as someone who wanted to be part of the movement towards liberation, what does that mean for me to be responsible and ethical, recognizing that I am a non-Black person of color, woman of color? And so when I didn't have those answers of my ethnicity and culture, I didn't know how to find my place in the movement. And so um, I went to Ancestry DNA. And uh, at first, it even just said East Asian. It didn't even give me, you know, any specifics. And so I just continued to feel like it's a big gray area. Like it was really a, no a nothing. Like I was really, again, you know, another aspect of being an adoptee, at least in my, per my personal experience, was I was feeling very disposable growing up. Like I was not wanted, like I was not worthy of love. And so to, again, to go through this as an adult where you take a test wanting more answers and then still feeling like, oh, okay, that's pretty, you know, <laughs> that's not an answer that I wanted to get. I wanted specifics, um, but you know, eventually technology has caught up with itself and more people have taken the test. And so eventually it said, now you're 50% Filipino. And um, it also matches you up with other people who have taken the test. Uh, which I was unaware of when I first took that. And so pretty soon I got this list of second cousins, third cousins, fourth cousins, and knowing that, yes, some of them definitely have that English German background. And there were other people on that list that were Filipino and had other uh, mixed races as well. Um, and eventually there became about two or three um, individuals that came up as close family. And so that, when I saw that come up, really terrified me because um, when I first reunited with my birth mother, she told me that she had no way of contacting my birth father, hence the adoption, and had not no information about um, him or the family. So I kind of just kind of crossed it off my list, like that's not ever going to happen for me. That's an impossible desire. So why even consider that? Um, but once those close family members popped up, it became more and more obvious that it was possible. And for a long time, I had it in my heart that I was not open to it, that I was not open to reaching out. And um, it was really interesting. I had a, a conversation with a family member maybe three months before my auntie reached out on D Ancestry DNA saying, who are you? We'd love to know how we're connected. It says that we're close family and we have no idea who you are <laughs> and we know everyone in our family. Um, but it was three months before that, that I had a conversation with a, another family member that really cracked my heart open and said, after that, you know, I think I am open to it if the universe brings it my way. And so it was truly that um, to me in my story, I felt like I had to open my heart up to it for it to come into my life. And all of a sudden I had this message from my auntie and um, it was you know, within weeks when she's, <laughs> she sent out um, to her whole family, like we have this, this um, child that's connected to us, you know, who, who could possibly be the father. And so um, eventually we found out which one of her brothers is my dad. 
And uh, in February of 2020, right before um, COVID-19 really hit the, the states, uh, we were able to meet in Portland and uh, my aunties, a bunch of cousins, and then my dad flew in from Hawaii to meet me for the first time. I'm like tearing up <laughs> just thinking about your journey and um, and how this is one of those moments where you realize that, wow, ancestors really do have our backs. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and what I think is so unique about you and the path that you chose is that in spite of you growing up in a predominantly white community that you still found your way back home that you mm -hmm. still felt that longing to connect mm -hmm. with your roots because I see so many Asian Americans and um, even just like people of the global majority who reject where they come from or even don't even have an awareness. And the, the curiosity is there, but not strong enough to want to go and find the answers because there's a lot of pain. Like I'm mm -hmm. afraid what's gonna be on the other side or what if mm -hmm. I find my family and and they don't want me. So why would I want to go through that trauma at all? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so what was, what was the, how, how is it that you ended up choosing decolonization as a pathway versus full on assimilation into white culture and white supremacy? Because um, yeah, like, like tell us more about your environment as well, growing up and um, like, obviously you knew you were different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whew. Yeah. I, I feel like I have to take it way, way back to, um, when I was about two years old, um, because I was adopted by a single mother who's also a pastor. And so I grew up in the church. Um, she was a Lutheran pastor as well as now she's ordained in the Presbyterian church. Um, but I grew up, um, going to church every Sunday, going to Bible school. And, and I sang my first solo in church at two years old. And so um, just to kind of paint that picture, um, the way that my mom does for me is that she held me in her arms and held a microphone up to my mouth as I sang the, the song, Still, Still, Still. Still, still, still. And she says that even at two years old, I was able to sing it, you know, with perfect pitch and, you know, <laughs> as moms love to um, paint that picture, but um, she's holding me. And then I look out at this congregation of white faces. And so for me growing up, that was kind of the place that I always found myself was I was safe and congratulated and loved when I was up in front of a church singing but I was surrounded by people that didn't look like me, that I knew truly, I experienced a lot of religious trauma as well. And so also just knowing that they weren't really there to protect me or care for me, but that it felt very extractive and exploitative in the ways that I was able to share this gift of my voice and be accepted for aspects of who I was. But when I stepped off the stage or stepped off this those steps that I just became a no one a nobody um and one and someone that was you know really never belonged and never found a place but maybe in the choir loft and so singing and choirs became my safe place it became my home because when I couldn't be within my mom's arms I was being taken care of by the choir or being taken care of by going to the choir director who saw me for my gifts and my talents. Um, but other places within the church and within the community, I could hear the comments and hear the sneers and hear all of those other negative things that were um, within those toxic environments. And so um, because choir became a safe home, that's where my safe home became at school as well. And so it was always seeking community and seeking a place of belonging that music was providing me. And so I just kept chasing that. 
So when I went to college, I um, went to Millican University, my alma mater for uh, music education, vocal music education. And, you know, I was singing in sometimes five choirs at a time and, you know, just constantly producing and singing and, you know, in a very productive capitalistic way of making art because it was just a constant extraction of my talent. Um, and, and I can say that now because I've, I've done that work to realize what, what that experience really was. But at the time, it was an opportunity to be surrounded by my friends, to be surrounded by others, and to feel like I wasn't alone in the world. Mm. And to be in an environment where you were praised, yes. only to then choose to go forth and get your PhD in mm -hmm. this degree that you made up around mm -hmm. decolonizing music yeah and so <laughs> in spite of in spite of you being formally trained going through higher education singing mm -hmm. opera singing in mm -hmm. choir how is it then that you chose decolonizing music specifically as mm -hmm. your focus so it was my second year of my doctorate um, that I took this curriculum class in the music education area um, where I learned about the organization nonprofit decolonizing the music room. That was the first time I'd ever even really heard the word decolonizing or decolonization. And it just sparked enough interest at that point that I started to really start to dig into it. But that was two months before I met my dad. So there was just kind of a seed planted in this class, in this community that I was in, that was very progressive. This class was a life-changing class for me. Um, and that seed was planted, you know, October, November, December of 2019. And then I met my dad in February of 2020. And I started learning about, like I said, Spanish colonization in the Philippines. And all of this just started to come come together for me and for me to see oh wow this is how this is how I got here today <laughs> um, because of so many years and years and hundreds of of years of my ancestors experiencing violence and separation from their pre-colonial belief systems and and lives and um so I just started to trace back, you know, how did I get here in this ivory tower? How did I get these um, privileges to have the opportunity to even go after a doctorate um, when so many of my ancestors have experienced so much harm leading up to this? And so um, it was really that unpacking of my inner critic and my inner colonizer um, that helped me to realize that my particular positionality, because I am biracial and because I am adopted and raised by a white family, that there were a lot of privileges that I was granted through those experiences. However, with those privileges of having access to education, that also continued to colonize me even more. And so I felt like through my, my childhood and being surrounded by folks that identified as white and not identifying with their particular culture, like Italian, French, German, German um, that that whiteness is really the, the evil in the room because it just makes everything else um, less than. And so it was really unpacking all of that within my own life and which I continue to do daily um, that, that I see, you know, oh, okay, these beliefs that I had about myself and others needs to be questioned. Every little bit of who I am has to be questioned now to check in, is this truly who I am? Or is this a colonized belief that has been implanted within me that I want to excavate and, and remove and really start to listen to the truth that is within, within me? And at the root of it, decolonization comes down to choosing love without mm -hmm. 
bypassing the difficult emotions that come mm -hmm. with this journey of reclamation, the anger and mm -hmm. the grief, cultivating a new relationship with it. And so I'm wondering if because this path had already been sparked for you when you met your father, it was easier to approach him or greet him from mm -hmm. that place of compassion. What were the first emotions mm -hmm. that surfaced for you in your reunion? Ooh, so much shame. Um, my, you know, something that I've really thought about too, along with my education is that all of my teachers have been white men. All of my mentors have been white men and how I was constantly looking for approval and validation from them and how much that truly was just the approval and validation and love that I was seeking from my own father. And so when I started to connect with my dad and talk to my dad, literally after we met that one weekend in Portland, we talked every day on the phone since. And um, so a lot of feelings about I am really colonized. I'm really white. I don't know what he's talking about when he shares stories about his life. Um, you know, he was born and raised in, in Oahu. And so even just the Hawaiian pigeon language that he would be using, I would have to ask questions like, I'm sorry, I don't know what that means. I'm sorry, can you explain that? And so I was, as this perfectionist straight A student that I am, I felt like a failure as his daughter. And so it was constantly having to have more compassion for myself that my childhood did not prepare me to be his daughter. <laughs> and that actually now in this reunion, I have an opportunity to not be the straight A perfectionist and that I just get to be a human that wants to connect with her father and to be in a, honest, vulnerable relationship that can acknowledge that I was jealous of my, of my siblings that got to grow up with him, that I was envious of the types of ways that they got to connect with my dad as they were growing up. And now me in my adulthood, I now get that opportunity, but, you know, feeling like our, our childhood is something that we want to have nostalgia about and love. And when I looked back at that time, when we were reconnecting, I just felt like it, it wasn't what I wanted it to be. But at the same time, it was everything I needed it to be for me to be in this place, in this moment, to have that compassion, to reach out to him and say, I want to learn. And I'm ready to kind of give up this, this facade of all of these degrees that I have that I was just trying to prove myself and uh, get validation for me to really ultimately find my dad and find my family so that I could find myself. And so it is 2022. It's been a little bit over two years since you reconnected with your biological father, as well mm -hmm. as so many of your Filipino family members. And out of all the places you choose, <laughs> yeah. your father loves you enough to uproot himself from paradise, mm -hmm. Oahu, mm -hmm. and uh, reroute himself to be close to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How has that been? It's so and this is recent, by the way. This is very, yeah. very recent. So like, like three uh, weeks like, ago, like he got here. <laughs> 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 three weeks, y'all. Um, I went from not having my dad in my life for 27 years to within the last two years of reunion, now having the opportunity to spend every single day with him. And it is such a blessing. And also, you know, I am human, he is human, and we are learning how to live with each other. And, you know, we both have our own ways of doing things. And so, yeah, I, 
do feel myself kind of coming out as a teenager every once in a while, like dad, (laughs) why are you doing that dad? Um, You know, so it's just so funny to be able to see again, you know, this is not a linear experience. We are always in a very cyclical, non-linear growth um, cycle. So it is beautiful to see how human we are with each other every day. Um, But yeah, we find ourselves here in the Midwest, um, a place that I really was ashamed of. Again, shame comes up a lot in my story, um, but ashamed of growing up here. Um, But it was the place where I met my husband in college in my undergraduate program. And uh, we decided uh, when we got married last summer that we would return to these lands to be closer to his family. And um, through that decision, like you said, my my dad has been willing and um, to, to move here and relocate. And so we find ourselves literally in the middle of Illinois, <laughs> um, where again, it's predominantly white folk. And um, we look around and we're the, we're the only Filipinos. <laughs> we're usually the only brown folks in the restaurant. Um, and, and we kind of look at each other and just kind of smile and, and joke about it. But um, we believe that there's a lot of work that we can do um, creativity that we have that we want to share with this community um, and our story about reconnection and what what family really means and uh, doing that through just uh, food <laughs> mainly yeah. um, and connection and um, sharing our story of, of reunion. Yeah, so tell us about the ways that you both are rerouting yourself in this predominantly white community and why it was important that you stayed there versus having the opportunity to live in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, the very real aspects of, of the story is that, you know, Hawaii is stolen land Um, and that it is very, very expensive to to live there. And um, because of tourism, because of capitalism and colonialism, um, it's very, very difficult to um, survive, (laughs) to be real, Um, to survive and to have um, an income that is supportive to a family to really thrive um, if you don't already have um, resources and access to um, you know, jobs and all of that. So it's very difficult to relocate um, to the islands. Um, And so being here um, with my husband and my family, my dad um, was interested in coming here, not only for our reunion, um, but he's really interested in creating a food truck, a Filipino Hawaiian food truck um, for for this community, for this very small town, um, rural area, um, to be able to share Filipino culture, Hawaiian culture, and the meaning of Ohana and Kapwa um, with this very colonized community that um, has not been able to experience uh, what it means to really decolonize and connect with one's culture. Yeah, and you also mentioned that you are about an hour and a half from St. Louis. So tell mm-hmm. us the significance of you being in proximity to that area. Yeah, I thought it was so interesting when I started to learn about this um, a couple of years ago, um, just because I have so much, so many family members here. Um, but in St. Louis, um, in 1904, there was the World's Fair um, that was in this area in St. Louis and the World's Fair had a lot of problematic, really nasty things going on there. And one of those things was that there was literally a human zoo for white folks to just come and look at other other people. And uh, one of those um, uh, one of those areas was a Filipino uh, village. And so the many of those um, Filipinos, from my understanding and reading, um, are from the Ilocos region, where, um, where my ancestors are from, from the northern regions, um, indigenous tribes from that area. 
And so I feel like it's very much a, a reclamation of Filipino people and the diaspora and where we have found ourselves throughout this, this globe, um, but in this world um, specifically, um, that we are here to reclaim and tell their story um, that that we are here and we continue to survive. And now we are here not to be a, an exhibit, but to, to be teachers, to be culture bearers and to um, reclaim this, this land as, um, and, and to really talk about the, the first peoples of this land as well, you know, to, to, get to the, the deeper points of decolonization of how we've been separated and how First Nations people have been separated and displaced from this area as well. Um, so to share our stories in order for us to be closer to the land and to be better stewards of this land. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I can already feel all the ways that you are healing not just your own family, but even your surrounding area, uh, just even with beginning, uh, beginning with that acknowledgement. And, and I just feel like decolonization can be such a heady thing that I want to know what are the ways you have seen a reflection of yourself in your father as now you are being invited to embody decolonization <laughs> mm -hmm. well you know i think it's so funny how my my work is all around the voice and um you know i think the one of the main things that i see in my dad is his really playful, boisterous energy that wherever he goes, he's talking to everyone. He doesn't care where he's at. He's going to reach out and say hello, say good morning, say, how are you doing? And for so much of my life, I just was shrinking myself and making myself smaller and not saying a word to anyone because I didn't want to bring attention to myself. And so through my relationship with my dad, that's been my biggest inspiration for reclaiming my voice because I see him using his voice as a way to connect with so many, no matter who they are or where he is, that um, he's able to create community through his voice. And he's so loud, <laughs> he can walk in anywhere and you can tell where he is. Um, and, and for me to see that as a, as a strength and as something that I really, see in myself that, you know, for so many years, I was told to be quiet, stop talking, you're talking too much, um, that that's colonization is that is taking people's voices away so that we don't have the ability to speak up for ourselves or for others. And so um, in reclaiming my voice, that is um, absolutely a gift that I've gotten from my dad. Oh, my gosh. Uh, what other uh, in addition to things that you are, I love how uh, outside of these older white men that have been your teachers, your dad <laughs> is really the, 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 the teacher of your decolonization journey. Um, mm -hmm. What are other things that you, you're, you've took notice of where you're like, oh my gosh, I really am my father's daughter. Mm -hmm. We immediately connected over food. Um, that was something that I, you know, cooking and, and food was something I was always drawn to, but never really thought that that would be something that I could do as a career or like I could become a chef someday, but it was always a place, the kitchen was always a place that I would go to, to decompress at the end of the day. So when I'd be singing all day long, what I really loved to do was to come home, cook a meal, dance in my kitchen and just zone out and be one with my ingredients and these flavors and to experience these senses in another way. And so when I started talking to my dad, I realized that he loves to cook and cooks, you know, three major big meals every single day. And so he would be cooking while we'd be FaceTiming every night. And so he'd be teaching me the, the recipes as we'd be talking. And so then pretty soon at 
the time I was living in um, in Phoenix, Arizona. And so I had access to a lot more <laughs> grocery stores and Asian markets and things. And so I'd go out and try and find all these ingredients. And pretty soon I'd be cooking the same meals as he was um, just to be able to taste the flavors and the ingredients that my ancestors had been working with um, was something that was so activating on a cellular level in terms of my decolonization um, that I was able to taste the flavors of patisse and to you know really start to understand what bitter melon is <laughs> I've never I had that before melon. in my love <laughs> and I love it so much now it took a while I will say it took me a couple of years to get used to it but now it's something that I I crave and I look forward to and um you know just these these ways that we're able to um learn more about ourselves through through food is is one of the most beautiful things that I've experienced and something that brings me so much joy is whenever I'm on your Instagram and I see the ways that you two are bonding in the kitchen through music mm -hmm. if I didn't know any better I would have just believed that you have been best friends for life and the fact mm -hmm. that this journey is is I mean, it's more than two years in the making, but in, in this Absolutely. timeline, it, it, it's mm -hmm. still just an infant. I'm just, I'm so excited for the journey that is ahead for the both of you, for the community that you are in, as well as anybody who gets to receive your medicine, Kiki, because the one of the, the ways that I have been so just honored to witness your growth is seeing how you are now able to take your teachings beyond the classroom into into in, into the larger community even nationally so tell us more about how is it that people can receive your medicine voice alchemy and some of the transformations mm. that your students in that container experience. Yeah, definitely. So through decolonizing the coral classroom in my research, I was starting to imagine what does this look like? What does the connecting with our voices look like on a, on a larger level for, for individuals that may not find themselves within choirs? Um, I wanted to create spaces that for people that just wanted to explore with their voices and to experience community care um, in a in an environment that gave permission to everyone to use their voice. And so I created this this event, this offering called Voice Alchemy that I've been sharing um, almost quarterly. And um, in these in these containers, we have meditation, we have embodiment practices, movement, um, and I collaborate with other facilitators and healers that um, bring their medicine to share with the community. Um, we, at our last Voice Alchemy event, we even had um, a sound bath and drag queen performance. Um, and so it was just so beautiful to see how individuals in, within the community are bringing in their whole selves to that we don't have to separate ourselves into these different boxes and fractions but that when we bring it together it's so much more powerful and potent and so um, through collaborating with other healers um, we have this two-hour event about and um, through the voice alchemy session that I worked with um, we we have storytelling where I share a lot of what I've shared today about my story and reconnection with my father and my decolonization journey. Um, and then inserting and sharing songs that have supported me throughout this journey as well. So um, bringing in songs a lot from um, beautiful chorus, India Ari, um, artists that are really spiritually grounded and have supported me in my spiritual journey and um, sharing this music as an offering to bring others along in that singing. And so it's a way for others to join in and sing along at those moments to um, reflect on how the stories that have been shared are connected to their own story and how we can start to see 
ourselves and one another, which is um, also a pre-colonial Philippinex um, word that we call kapwa. Um, kapwa means to see the self in the other. And that can mean in other human beings, it can mean within nature, within the, the larger universe and the cosmos, but to really see the divinity in all things. And so um, voice alchemy is an offering where we use music to be able to see ourselves in one another and to support one another in using our voices. Amazing. And you are also consulting with other educators around decolonization. Mm -hmm. So tell us more about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So I'm also working with one-on-one -on -one individuals as well as organizations who are interested in learning more about decolonization and how that can impact the systems and structures that they have in place for their organizations. So um, how they can start to imagine a more horizontal egalitarian approach to their um, their power dynamics that are already within the, the, the community. Um, and also just reimagining curriculum um, and pedagogical practices um, that can be used within the classroom or their workshops or other ways that they facilitate within communities um, so that we are creating decolonized spaces um, beyond just our school systems, but within the community as well. Yes. So um, tell me, what is it that you are currently doing to stay grounded and rooted in these times? And what is it that you're learning to release? Mm. Lately, I've been really turning to a lot of journaling and writing my own story and re reminding myself every day of, of my dreams of where I am continuing to envision um, myself because it has changed so drastically in the last couple of years. Um, going through um, the university system to gain, get my doctorate. And currently I find myself working as an interim adjunct instructor at a, at a university locally, uh, my alma mater, Millican University. Um, but actually seeing myself um, moving beyond the university again um, and not continuing with this position so that I can bring this medicine to uh, more communities and um, not being so locally bound, um, but actually imagining what decolonization within music could look like at a at, within um, the community in summer camps and actually imagining workshops for youth um, so that we can do this voice alchemy work and decolonization um, in a very practical way where we are connecting with the land, we're connecting with our ancestors and providing those, those practices and modalities um, with more individuals that are connecting with that medicine. Yeah, so amazing. Uh, so how is it that you would share with our listeners just like one thing they can do to begin their own decolonization journey today. And mm -hmm. I also want to acknowledge the real fear around even misappropriating our own ancestors' tradition and culture in the mm -hmm. process. So mm -hmm. what would that look like for somebody who's just starting their journey? Yeah, I love that. Um, so I learned this from Gabe's Torres um, and uh, Janelyn Umapeg on uh, Instagram. Um, they're two decolonization um, practitioners, um, people living it and doing it every day. Um, but that decolonization is really about relationships. And so starting off with your relationship with yourself your relationship with your community, your relationship to nature and the land around you. Um, but realizing that our relationship with self is that everything else is a reflection of our relationship with ourself. And so by starting to cultivate compassion for the very different parts that we have within us, the, you know, the, maybe the scared, eight-year-old that we have within us, the, the inner critic, the inner colonizer, the, um, the cheerleader that's within us, creating this relationship with all of these different aspects of who we are to really become closely 
related and so that we can hear their voices even more clearly to be able to discern which ones are our own and which ones are others so that we can begin to walk in alignment with our own energy and what feels right for us on a day-to-day -day basis that isn't a reaction through our you know tr triggers through our trauma and our coping mechanisms but our actual responses that are in alignment with who we are today with having compassion for the past that we've experienced and the live lives that we've lived but realizing that every present day we have an opportunity to listen and then respond in a way that we want to move forward in. Um, so creating a relationship with yourself through meditation, um, connecting with your ancestors through an ancestral altar, um, beginning to have conversations with our parents and our family members that we can have real honest conversations with, um, connecting with others who are also on this journey, whether that's through social media, um, on Instagram or Facebook or other communities that you may find yourself in so that you're finding um, your, your people, the people that will hold you in this process because decolonization, as much as it is a, a self-led journey, can really only happen in community because there are so many of these shadow aspects of ourselves that it is very difficult. And there are times that we'll experience extreme anger and grief and sadness, but there's also moments where we'll experience incredible um, joy and um, exhilaration about what we're learning and experiencing. And so it's finding that, that group of people, whether they're biological or chosen, who can see you for your for your truth and your whole self that can reflect back to you your wholeness even in those moments of of despair when we're we're going through those traumas whether it's ancestral intergenerational even past life traumas um so connecting with self through community mm. Mm -mm -mm. yes it's so much more than what you wear even learning the language it, it's it's really about who you be every single day in the world with every breath with every interaction and ah uh, your journey just gives me so much hope and so much joy for this next generation the future generations that may be also questioning where is it that i come from and as adverse as we can be with technology even seeing the ways that we can use it as a tool for our, our own liberation and healing and mm -hmm. you are a testament of that i'm so grateful that mm -hmm. you came to just share a little sliver of your story medicine today um, and i do have one more question so mm -hmm. if you can envision yourself as a future ancestor mm -hmm. who is looking back on Dr. Kiki today, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or maybe even that two-year-old version of yourself, mm -hmm. what are the words of wisdom that Shah would say? Hmm. Shaw would tell me, you have always been an embodiment of love. You have always been light and your inner truth and what guides you and your heart will always lead you on the path that is meant for you. Mm. Everybody give decolonization, decolonizing Kiki a follow and beyond a follow. If any of these words resonated in your heart, in your womb, and in your throat, acknowledge it, acknowledge it, share it, speak it, because for you to be here listening, I see is an invitation and a sign that you are on the right path, that your ancestors are divinely guiding you, and you are not walking this path alone. Mm 